What I kept hearing was that St. Vincent's Hospital is a private hospital and it can kind of do what it wants to do and it doesn't need to necessarily involve us, the, pu the public. Well, we did a little research and we discovered that St. Vincent's is a 501c3, which is a public charity. It files a 990 tax return. And in fact, it has an obligation to file annual tax uh, uh, financial information with the Attorney General's office. Then we looked, started to look at the Department of Health's regulations and we realized that for a hospital to close, it needed to give 90 days notice to the Department of Health it needed to submit a closure plan, a written closure plan that it got approval from. It needed to make sure that patients and, and, and doctors and nurses and the community was cared for before it began that process. So Governor Patterson secured $6 million for St. Vincent's Medical Center, $5 million of which was from GE investors, and begins discussions to find someone to take over the hospital. In specific, Mount Sinai shows an interest and begins negotiations. That's on March 2nd. On March 24th, Mount Sinai transi transition talks begin with St. Vincent. So clearly, they're moving ahead, and now they're discussing uh, transition. On March 25th, there's a hiring freeze that is imposed on St. Vincent's nurses. And on March 30th, the CEO of St. Vincent's, Kevin Davis, and Commissioner Davis have a discussion about Mount Sinai acquiring St. Vincent's and request for New York State Department of Health to support this happening. The following day, negotiations with Mount Sinai collapse. That was on March 31st, less than a month ago. Less than a month ago, we thought, we hoped, we believed that we would be able to get some sort of uh, deal done with Mount Sinai. A week later, on April 6th, behind closed doors, the Board of Trustees vote privately to shut down St. Vincent's Hospital. Now remember what I said, St. Vincent's Hospital is a what? A 501c3, it's a public charity. Okay. Two days later, two days later, there's a request for proposal, an RFP. RFPs usually take a lot of time to prepare and draft. Folks who've done that uh, on the panel can talk a little bit about that. Two days later, uh, the RFP is issued just two days after the vote for urgent care centers, an urgent care center that will replace and privatize St. Vincent's Hospital. How could they have completed these RFPs in two days? Right? The next day, St. Vincent sends written notice to the Department of Health that they intend to close. This is supposed to be a 90-day notice, yet they simultaneously begin closing down the hospital on that day. A day after they submitted the RFPs, by the way. April 14th, just five days later, St. Vincent's files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in U.S. Bankruptcy Court and submits a proposed interim order asking to be allowed to continue closing the hospital until the bankruptcy hearing, which is scheduled for May 6th, happens even though they know that the closures will be completed by April 30th. The order also directs that all issues be under the jurisdiction of the bankruptcy court. So when we went into state court to ask for equitable relief, we were only going to court to say, please, Department of Health, do what you're supposed to do. Supervise these. You are empowered with great powers. Enforce the law. Enforce the law. Right? The Department of Health has police powers. They can stop a closure if they want. They certainly can order an investigation of the Attorney General's office. And another thing is that we went around looking uh, long and hard to try to find the financial disclosures, uh, which we had difficulties finding. There were some of them, but there weren't all of them, and there weren't enough of them. Uh, on April 19, St. Vincent's admits that the entire hospital will be shut down on April 30th, 2010, a week before May 6, 2010's bankruptcy hearing, this will shield St. Vincent's from any consequences for failing to hold public hearings, failing to get approval of a written closure plan, or in any way having to answer to you, the public, or ensure public safety in the closure. It will also ensure that they are not stopped from illegally closing the hospital, which is what happened today. So what we tried to do was to get in front of a state court judge to ask that this happen. 
There were two prongs in our lawsuit. One was to stop the closure, and the second was to make sure, no matter what, that there was a hospital that could meet the needs of this community on a basic health issue, on an emergency care issue, on a, God forbid, a level of public health and safety. Myth number one, St. Vincent's is a private hospital and can close at any time. Lie. Lie. <laughs> Let's go to the truth. The truth is, it's a not-for-profit organization under state law. It is subject to the public health law, which lays out a, a policy for modification of certif certificates for hospitals. And it's also subject to the administrative regulations of the Department of Health, which you had pointed out, which require a 90-day notice and require the commissioner of the department to sign off on the closure prior to it happening. Run professionally by experts in the medical field. Why? Let's go to the truth. It was run, in effect, by many of the outside creditors of the hospital. On that chart, these two charts, by the way, the reason they're really small is they were prepared for presentation to the judge in court, in bankruptcy court. You're more than welcome to go up and take a look and see the numbers on these charts. The top 10 executives of that hospital paid themselves over $10 million in annual compensation every year. The hospital spent $206,000 for golf outing last year. The hospital paid over $30 million to outside consultants to do who knows what as they were running it into the ground. The board of directors refused all through last year when they were in the process of already putting together this closure plan to, um, to put in place a restructuring committee which the creditors were asking for. Why did they wait till January to do that? That's a big question. And you know, Christine Quinn, the speaker of the city council, at the rally that was held last week said something which is shocking to me. She said she had been meeting with St. Vincent throughout the year to talk about issues pertaining to the hospital, and the hospital never disclosed the financial distress to the city council person from this district at any time. I found that to be appalling. The St. Vincent's board of directors acted responsibly. It's a lie, right? Lies. Lies. They didn't comply with the open meetings law, which they were subject to after they took the $6 million that the governor and our state officials were able to allocate to keep the hospital in operation. They took their actions in secret and they refused to bring in the restructuring team in 2009 when arguably this could have been avoided. St. Vincent's complied with the law in closing the hospital. Yetta has already addressed this issue. They are not for profit. They apply. On that note, the Attorney General's office, you should all know, they're required to file annual disclosure statements so the public can look at their finances because they're a not-for-profit. They file them for a number of other St. Vincent's related entities. But guess what, folks? Do you think they filed them for the last five years for the hospital? Yes or no? No. no. They didn't file them for five years. They, but, oh, we can find them. And you know something? It's a public website, so I don't know. But they weren't there. Okay, they, they're using the administrative regulations, and what they're trying to do now, which we're not going to let them get away with, is once they filed that bankruptcy proceeding, they argued that the bankruptcy court judge, rather than a state court judge, should interpret the state's law as it comes to the closings of hospitals. We argued vehemently to the bankruptcy court judge, that's not your place. Your place is to allow a state court judge to rule on state law. Because all the bankruptcy court cares about is paying the creditors. And we get made a very compelling argument to the judge about, this is not about the creditors. She said, yeah, the creditors are going to get paid. And yet I said, what about the patients in the community? And the judge said, that's not my concern. And when they went into bankruptcy court, they knew what they were doing. They were hiding behind the bankruptcy court stay and the shield. It's wrong, and we're going to file a general objection, and we're going to continue to fight there. St. Vincent's was almost a billion dollars in debt. Truth or lie? Lie. Lie. Well, it's somewhat true and it's a lie. Well, in 2001, they changed their not-for-profit status, and what they did is they combined St. Vincent's Hospital with Sisters of Charity, 
and some other organizations into a new entity in 2001 with St. Vincent's Medical Center absorbing the debts of the other of unaffiliated organizations when they changed their status back in 2001. So where that debt came from and the argument that this, this hospital can't afford to operate in this community is a lie. A urgent care facility is as good as a hospital. No. No. Lie. My, my kind of feeling about this talk about urgent care centers is that it's kind of like, you know, you can walk into Dwayne Reed and get a flu shot. Yeah. Is that what they're suggesting? <laughs> that should replace this hospital? Department of Health fulfilled its mandate to oversee the operation of St. Duncan's Hospital. No. Lie. No. Okay. All of the actions have been cloaked in secrecy, but we went to state court, and, the ju and Judge Diamond, who did an excellent job in, in, in listening to the oral arguments, asked the Department of Health's attorney and the Attorney General's office, when did you submit your closure plan, St. Vincent's, to the commissioner under the 90-day statute, and when did Commissioner Gaines approve your closure plan? The lawyer didn't know what to say. She didn't know the date. She goes, well, it's an ongoing negotiation. That's not the law, folks. They violated the law. And nothing about the closure process has been released to the public. When we asked for the documents, you know what they told us? Put in a FOIL request, which would take months to receive these documents. Ensure that St. Vincent comply with the law. The truth or a lie? A lie. lie. Five years, and I'm not blaming the Attorney General. But what I am saying is there should be an investigation into why they were allowed to operate if they did not comply with the law. This can't happen again. Look, right. It's the future of healthcare. If people like you in this room do not come together, and I see Senator Tom Delaney just walked in, if he wants to join us up in our center. It's the future of healthcare. This battle is very important. I think the Senator Godfrey had a bill that he's going to talk about that he had recently um, put in, into the assembly, had been repassed, so I'll defer to you on that. But thank you all for coming out and not allowing this criminal act. I think it's a criminal act. I think they're the Enron of the not for profit business. Let me tell you something, folks. Yeah. That's what I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Believe it or not, I'm late because I was moving to the village so I could walk to St. Vincent's for the next 20 years. I've been there 30 years, but uh, that, didn't quite, that didn't quite work out, as you uh, all know, so I apologize for being late. Uh, the other thing I noticed, I was driving back and forth all day from uptown to downtown. At least five ambulances caught in traffic with their sirens blaring, their lights flashing, and moving about five feet a minute, if they were lucky. And I thought about the people who would be in those ambulances now that this hospital is closed. The emergency room is where people go when they don't know what's wrong and they're having chest pain or their arm is asleep because they're having a stroke or they're bleeding to death from falling or they broke a hip when they fell or they're hit by a cab or hit by a car or fell off their bike and cracked their skull open or they think they're having a stomach ache but it's actually a heart attack. Okay? Absolutely, people also go to the emergency room with runny noses and sore throats and sore arms. But that's, a, that's, that's the fault of our healthcare system. Too many people use the emergency department for things they don't need to. What the state has done is turn that on its head and say, oh, well, we'll just open up an urgent care center so that the, the people that use the emergency department for non-emergent uses will have an urgent care center, and all the people who really need an emergency room get screwed, okay? Just try to picture you're having chest pain and you're on right here on Ninth Avenue, and you have to travel somewhere between two and three and a half miles in traffic. You're in gridlock, you have to cross town. I think you all know crossing town is about five times harder than going north or south. Um, and meanwhile, your heart attack is occurring, the oxygen's cut off to your heart, your muscles are dying, or you're having a stroke. And your stroke, your brain is dying. The, the neurologists who are on a stroke team at St. Vincent's, which was one of the best in the country, had a uh, big sign in the emergency room which said, time is brain. And uh, Dr. Togovnik over here can tell us it's probably a matter of about four minutes before you've finished. Four minutes in an ambulance is about two blocks, maybe? <laughs> two blocks, okay? You're having a stomach ache, so you think, oh, I have a stomach ache, no big deal, and you go to your urgent care center. 
uh, the physicians that are in the room, and I see several, will know, all know that one of the signs of a heart attack in a certain portion of the wall of the heart is a stomach ache. So you sit in the urgent care center for two hours, two and a half hours, you get a person who is not an emergency department trained physician to evaluate you, and by now you've probably knocked off a portion of your heart muscle, and they say, wow, this man is having a heart attack. Let's send him to, an, to a hospital with an emergency department. And another hour passes, or another 30 minutes passes. And now you've passed the time that's critically necessary to get into a cath lab and save that heart. It's a scam and it's a fraud being perpetrated on the people who live down here. All right. And I'm one of those people. I live down here too. All right. And I guarantee you, absolutely, that people will die. And I, one of the things I asked when uh, one of the radio interviews, of course they didn't play this piece of the interview, is that I challenge, I challenge the politicians of New York, Quinn, everybody, the governor, the famous Commissioner Danes, I challenge them to publicly log the ambulance runs from the Lower West Side and the outcomes of those runs. Uh, when they stopped the ambulance runs to the hospital, um, in the space of three days, there were rumors flying around the hospital that two people arrested in ambulances on, on a, I think it was a Friday and a Monday. And I know a fair number of people, having been down here a long time, and including ambulance drivers and paramedics, and I asked around, and they asked around, and they ran into a stone wall. The two patients were brought to Roosevelt, I believe. They could not get any information from FIDNI, Fire Department of New York, who runs our 911 system, or from anyone in the ER, what actually happened to these two patients. There was, an, there was information that there were patients with heart attacks in the ambulances, but, but it stopped dead right there. So I really mean that. We need to demand, you need to demand, what's happening. Because I guarantee, as people die, it will just be a small statistic. It's not going to show up in the paper. It's not going to show up in any bulletin board. You're not going to hear about it. And so, you know, Patterson and Danes will be able to stand up there and say, well, hey, this is working. Look at all the sore throats that got treated effectively. You need an ED, an emergency department. Urgent care is garbage, okay? You can get urgent care in my office, in Dr. Togovnik's office, in Dr. Johnston's office, in Dr. Call's office, all right? We all do urgent care all day long. Granted, we don't stay open all night long, that's true. But it's not, you know, it's not uh, rocket science to do urgent care. And in order to have an emergency department, you have to have a hospital. You can't have one without the other. That's the other part of this scam and fraud. To say an urgent care and emergency in the same sentence and act like, like uh, um, somehow that's okay and a good substitute for a hospital is a, a sad, sad joke. But I'm sorry we didn't start this two months ago or three months ago. Yes, six months ago. Or, or six months ago. Um, you know, there's a bunch of docs in the, in the, in the room and uh, there are a thousand doctors at St. Vincent's. We've been talking for weeks and weeks and weeks and fighting and arguing, actually for years with the administration. I'm going to have to tell you, at this point, the docs can't do anything. We have our offices. We're not going anywhere. We're going to stay in this community and work, but we need to use... The, the, sad, the sad problem is we need to use different hospitals, and it's as, it's as big a shock for me as it is already for my patients. I won't go into stories, but I've already started having them. The only way this is going to change is things like this. You have to be here. You have to be in the streets. Otherwise, they're just going to let you get tired, and it's going to disappear, and then they'll have their urgent care center. can't stop. My hospital closed today, but more important, your hospital closed today. And that really concerns me. I don't live in this area. I've been one of those that intruded on you for 24 years. 24 of the happiest years of my life. I look around this room and I see some of the patients that I've had in the 24 years. And urgent care is not emergency care. Urgent care, if you Google it, have a really good look at it. The state that has the most urgent care places is South Carolina. Many, many places. The next is Florida, and the next is Louisiana. And I challenge anybody to take any town or city in any of those states and compare it to this wonderful island of Manhattan. It doesn't work. You are in danger down here. You have no hospital on the Lower West Side. 
and there's eight just across on the east side. I say just across, it's going to take you a long time to get over there if you have an emergency. I thought I was working for the Sisters of Charity in a nice Catholic hospital. I'm embarrassed by what I saw up here. I've never seen those numbers before. You need a revolution downtown. You people have got to have a revolution. The nurses who have worked there, their pensions may be extinguished as part of the bankruptcy. Shame. Oh. Shame. Oh. That the members of 1199, the people who changed the bed camp, and it's Enron, I agree with you, may lose their pensions as part of this bankruptcy. It is absolutely outrageous. The New York City, the New York City pension fund invest in money in St. Vincent's Hospital, that money might be lost. So it's, it, you know, the, it's an amazing thing to look at these bankruptcy filings and to see how many working people are going to lose their life savings because people I believe have who acted criminally in the way they operated this hospital played golf for $206,000 a year. I've been a patient over at St. Vincent since the 1970s. St. Vincent's has saved my life a total of three times to date. I am only standing before you now because of St. Vincent's and their emergency room. Twice I went, in, I went there from my Chelsea apartment with an anaphylactic shock where I could not breathe. There's no way I could have gotten up to St. Luke's or to Bellevue or anywhere else. I am also currently a St. Vincent's cancer patient and St. Vincent's was there for me when I could not get service at any other hospital. Um, St. Vincent's has now um, treated my cancer and I am cancer free. Now I'm also a volunteer EMT and have been all my adult life and I want to speak to the compassion of St. Vincent's and to their mission to serve the poor, the disadvantaged, to people who cannot get care elsewhere. Now, I'm a transgender person, and one of the few things you probably don't know about St. Vincent's is that they were the only hospital who consistently always delivered compassionate, kind, welcoming, warm care to my community. St. Vincent served my little transgender community with a kind of kindness that we could not find elsewhere. They are the main place that we go for care. We are each a little community unto ourselves, and many of us are denied care regularly everywhere else we go, especially the poor, the disadvantaged, people who don't speak English too well. And St. Vincent's has long had the mission to serve people who could not get care elsewhere. I don't think it's any accident that the only community hospital who has served the underprivileged, people like me, who are, are shunned at other facilities, is closing. To me, it's a great example of good guys finish last and we cannot allow this to happen because we're New Yorkers, because we care about each other, because we care about the people who will otherwise die without a nonprofit, socially just institution to help us stay alive. As an EMT, I get to meet people when you are bleeding. When you are terrified from that chest pain that the doctor so aptly described, when you're having that stroke, when your mother is having that stroke and you may be losing her. Okay, as an EMT, I get to hear the families cry. The families cry and they never get over the loss when people die unnecessarily. We, on the Lower West Side, we need that hospital. We need that emergency room for all the reasons that we've just spoken. It is a crying shame that that hospital has been allowed to go under. And I do want to point out to the politicians that we now have 18 full service hospitals on the east side. We are now down to four on the west side. Okay, and that's not just a slap in the face to the west side. 
that is a stab to our heart. And that will be a fatal stab to our heart. Just think when the holidays come and all those people are coming into shop. Do you know how long it takes for me and driving an ambulance to get across town to Bellevue to take you with that chest pain, with that, with that arm falling asleep, if you're bleeding out, if your child has asthma and cannot breathe, we're not going to make it there for you, folks. We're not going to make it. All the lights and sirens in the world are going to fix this. St. Vincent's was there during 9-11. Now, do you think that that's the last terrorist attack we are going to have in Lower Manhattan? Who here believes that that's the last terrorist attack that's going to happen in Lower Manhattan? We've already had two. 3,000 lives lost. Now, as an EMT, I'm not an expert on anti-terrorism efforts, but one thing we are trained, if you have a chemical attack or a bioterror attack, it is critically important to have geographic containment of that terrorist threat. Those weapons must be contained. You can't have people carrying chemical and biological weapons all over the city of Manhattan. You'll lose all of Manhattan. We cannot afford this. We need a hospital. We cannot have a medically underserved huge swath of Manhattan in the event of another terrorist attack. And I want to tell you straight out, Lower Manhattan is too big to fail. We cannot. We, we cannot allow our entire community to go without care. We cannot allow another 9-11. Look at what 9-11 did to our country. It destroyed huge areas of economic prosperity for our country for years, not just Manhattan. So St. Vincent's has played a role all the way from the little lives of a transgender person who needs cancer care and can't get it anywhere else to the good of our country. And St. Vincent's deserves our support. Thank you. So we're all upset and angry. Uh, St. Vincent's was my hospital too. Um, and uh, I have to say that I don't want to speak for uh, other elected officials, but um, I know that I was surprised that there weren't red flags from the hospital uh, earlier. Um, and in fact, really, the first red flag came from the health department, not from the hospital. Um, there were some budget cuts. Uh, it was called the Deficit Reduction Plan in November, early December, and I have this letter on my desk from the uh, head of the hospital saying thank you very much because we avoided mid-year cuts uh, to the hospital in that Deficit Reduction Plan, and I look forward to working with you on next year's budget. Um, and I think that when the first proposal came out that there be urgent care and a reduced sort of ambulatory care thing that was floated by Beth Israel and Continuum, everybody spoke with a united voice and said, no, 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 that's not enough. The governor put a task force together. There were, it seemed like daily, you know, briefings and questions. Um, I have to say most of the elected officials were participating in that. Um, the mayor's office was not until at some point somebody said, where's the mayor's office? And then somebody was on the call uh, a few times. Um, I don't know who it was. Um, and I don't think they ever said anything except that they were on the call. I think we all thought we went up to the gate and thought we had a partner in Mount Sinai. And I don't know what happened, but clearly, you know, the last two years, we've all been talking to them about a new hospital and drawings and plans, and uh, I think we're all still in shock. And while I'm generally an optimist, you know, this whole situation is so um, convoluted and inexplicable on so many levels that I don't know what to think. 
sometimes it, it requires, you know, uh, the pick, pitchforks around the, uh, the castle. I'm not sure who's to blame or if there's lots of blame or bits and pieces of it. Uh, I hope that we can tease it out. Um, the hospital is closed. I don't know if a community hospital can be raised up. Hope that we all can see a new way, uh, and I, even though I don't know what that is, I hope we can see a new way together uh, so that we all wind up having the hospital that we need, need, not just for the people who live here, but for the tens of thousands who work every day in this area and the hundreds of thousands that invade, I mean, who visit um, on a regular basis. It's May 11th at 2 p.m. I'm going to be in Supreme Court to fight to make sure that the state, the city, even the federal government understands that it's a necessity to have a hospital in every community. There's no way, no how, that we shouldn't be having a hospital on the west side. That's the first thing. Second, I'm going to challenge, and I have a great relationship with our local elected officials here. There's no way that you guys, Tom, Dick, Chris, Scott, should sit down and let it happen either. Because I have numerous seniors who are confused. Some who came here 60, 70 years ago from Puerto Rico, and all they know is Chelsea, the village where the hospital was, and Puerto Rico. They don't know anything else. I had a senior tell me the other day, as I was walking to the supermarket, Miguel, can I speak to you? I said, sure. She said, I want to know the truth. Is the hospital really going to close? I said, you know, the saddest part about it, I think so. But how? How can this happen? Not in these days. Not in the days when our President Obama, who many of us in attendance probably supported, has put together a health care reform bill to give us health insurance for every single citizen in the United States. But for what? To take to an institution that is no longer there? At a resident who lives here, who made it to St. Vincent's Hospital, the doctors told her, three minutes more and you're not here tomorrow. These are true stories. I have a patient sitting in the front who has to have heart surgery. They told her she has to wait an extra week because they don't have room for her. You know, these are stories that the commissioner, our local elected officials, the governor needs to understand. They did an investigation on the RFP process at the racetrack. They need to do a real investigation here. We were never told anything. It was backdoor, backdoor, backdoor meetings over and over and over. And the public is fed up. This is our community. We're not going to sit down. We're going to continue to organize. We're going to continue to harass Governor Patterson, Commissioner Danes. We're going to call him every single day until this hospital stays open. God bless everyone and thank you. Whatever questions I'm answering, Let's all remember that nothing here matters if it isn't about the patients and the people of this community. And, you know, things like financial viability of this, that, or the other thing only matter if they are about delivering health care to people in this community. That's what this is all about. Urgent care is going to be important but never let anybody try to stand up and tell you that that is any kind of alternative or replacement for a hospital. Any more than, you know, if your ship sinks, a lifeboat is really important, or even floating wreckage at that point, but floating wreckage, while you will cling to it, is not an alternative to your ship. Uh, so, If this were happening in any other city in the state of New York, probably in any other city in the country, the mayor of that city would be, would be front and center screaming bloody murder. And 
while it is true at almost every meeting there was an observer from the city administration uh, sitting in the back row. Not good enough. We never heard from Mayor Bloomberg. And, uh, you know, he, he finds it in his heart to get exercised about a whole lot of things. You know, he's exercised about uh, uh, financial reform being debated in Congress and how he thinks that's not going to be good uh, for New York City. You know, the loss of this hospital, the loss of the only hospital between what used to be called Beekman Downtown and Roosevelt on 60th Street, the loss of the only hospital in that stretch of the world that uh, is home to several hundred thousand people and the workplace of several million people, you know, that can't be good uh, for New York City. Uh, you know, I, I think the mayor should have been in a couple of press conferences at least. Am I enraged about what's happened? Yes. 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 I am enraged. And am I unbearably sad and uh, upset about what happened today? Yes. And I know, I know that absolutely everyone in this room feels the same way that I am feeling, all at the same time, enraged and sad and upset, and and so, because it's not a rally, right? I mean, I, I, we could rally, you know, but this isn't a rally, so, and I, so let me, I'm bringing my personal to my enraged, like my heart is already, like it's beating really fast. So, this morning, I went to the funeral of a guy named Harry Weeder, who some of you may know, who's a disabled, physically disabled, very clear, LGBT, disabilities, uh, transportation, safety, and access to health care activists. And he, his funeral is today. And everyone is talking about stroke, and I've already, many of you know my mom died as a result of a stroke this year. And when I see you, I think of all of the nurses at St. Vincent's Hospital that wouldn't put on gowns and masks, that would walk into rooms that would treat people living with HIV when they were dying and throwing up and starting their beds. HIV doctor, he's not doing HIV, he's doing substance abuse. And I don't know where he's going to end up. So, look, what do we want? We want what we have. We want an emergency room and we want a full service hospital. That's what we want. Community hospital. We want a hot St. Vincent's, listen, maybe bad business decisions. You know, this is, but they treated you regardless of your ability to pay, and I'm not going to settle, and none of us should settle, and Harry Weider wouldn't settle, and none of you should settle for any health care facility that doesn't take everyone regardless of ability to pay. Listen. <laughs> when all of us, we like to we're trying to do it. Come on, please come and buy. Please come and take over St. Vincent's. There were those that said, we'll take your private pay, but you know, we don't know about Medicaid. They can go to Bellevue. They can go to hell! I want what we had. We want what we had, but for everyone, not just private pay, for everyone. If you are on Medicaid, if you use Medicare, if you're Family Health Plus or Child Health Plus, if you're in managed care or you have no insurance at all, we want treatment for you and we can understand the last. What kind of a system we have that has, that allowed a health care facility to go $800 million into debt to GE Capital? Why, why is the public sector 
not running our health care system, right? So I don't know why my thought I didn't take it over, but you know what? $800 billion in debt to a private entity. Does that make you mad too? It does make me mad. $800 billion to some private corporation when people might die because we can't get to an emergency room. That is wrong. But is that regardless of ability to pay, everybody gets the health care from emergency room to full service hospital to every clinic regardless of ability to pay. And I'm not going to give up until we get that back. So I just want to say I'm sorry Chris couldn't be here tonight. We're here to listen to you. That's why we're here. Uh, 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 you know, what we want is uh, emergency care, just like the rest of you. I share uh, Tom no, Green's we outrage. Want we, want we want a hospital. We want a hospital, not a emergency. Emergency care and a hospital go hand in hand. I understand that. And, uh, she's been, I thought what she's been saying is emergency care. The years that I've lived in New York, I've lived within a walking distance of Washington Square and St. Vincent's Hospital. It's been my hospital and it's been my square. And in 1963, I made the square world famous by writing Washington Square with the village stompers. I'm sitting here, I'm sitting here with a gentleman. Who, I'm sitting here with a gentleman who on the night of 2001, June 10th, my birthday, instead of electing to be out of town to celebrate my birthday, stayed in his apartment on 10th Street in New York City. Because of that, when he realized he was having a heart attack, he was able to call 911 and go out into the hall and wait for the paramedics. They got him there in time. My partner, Albert Marcus, with the black hat, is here because St. Vincent was here and because they could get him to the hospital before he lost the primary cell. We have to do something. People are talking about a lot of things. Let me tell you what this really is, people. Unfortunately, the teabaggers are right. This is the first instance of death panel because of inadvertency, because of secrecy. Oh! This is a death panel working, and people are going to die because of this over the years. So what I don't understand is how the politicians, and Dick Godfrey, Tom Dwayne, I don't understand, I understand your cough between, whatever your cough between, but I don't understand how we can fund the car dealerships around America and the banks around America, and we can't fund the hospital system. First of all, I want to thank the nurses, and EMT for saving my life. I would, think, I would think Family Health Plus for a short time, I had a heart attack. My heart stopped. EMT started it and I woke up with a stent. My mother, who had Alzheimer's, was brought in for a week into the Alzheimer's division, the, the area of St. Vincent's. What other hospital has an Alzheimer's unit? For four years, I have been speaking at the community board, pleading for them to open their books. They want to build a big, <coughs> fancy building. We wanted to make sure they were out of bankruptcy. They wouldn't open their books. I've been told there was a second set of books. Now we find out exactly what's been going on. For four years, where were the politicians? Where was the community board? I've been only for 40 years on the west side. I've had hysterectomy in St. Vincent's. I've had a, a pacemaker put in at St. Vincent's. I've run five nights in a row in my wheelchair from 25th and 9th to St. Vincent's because a prescription was given and they filled it wrong. And I was, oh, you just don't know the feeling when you can't breathe, you're burning up and you can't do anything, and you can't wait, you have to go. St. Vincent's takes you right in the door, and they took care of me. For five nights in a row, they didn't go crazy. What's wrong with this woman, is she crazy or something? No, they checked and checked until they found out that my prescription was filled wrong. By the grace of God, I would have been dead two more days of taking the medication that I was given. And I thank God for St. Vincent's, and I hope we get out there and fight for the nurses, First they cut the fire departments out, then they mess with the police, and now they're taking on nurses? God help us, we're in trouble. Please help us. St. Vincent Catholic Medical Center has been raping communities all over the city. In order to put resources into St. Vincent Manhattan, they closed the hospital in a part of Staten Island where poor people live. They closed the hospital in Central Brooklyn. 
They sold off two hospitals in Southeast Queens um, to, and, and, and the institution that came in to run them couldn't run themselves. So, um, so those hospitals closed as well. These were more, I want a hospital here because I live here, but the communities that got raped were more medically underserved than this community. We've got a lot more resources. I just wish that voices were heard two years ago, three years ago when this started happening. They pulled resources out to put into St. Vincent's Manhattan and then couldn't even do it with those resources. I want, you know, who comes out of bankruptcy owing $700 million? Nobody except this incompetent administration and board of trustees. I have served 39 years in St. Vincent. Five years ago, when it was a, a, a large cut, I was one of them, and they had to hire two part-timers, and they couldn't even do what I did. And, and all the money from the golf parties and everything else should be refunded, and the, and the corporations should join, should join a famous stockbroker in the same prison as a, as a roommate. <laughs> We have about uh, 300 seniors that really counted on St. Vincent's. And uh, the good news about that is, as one gets older, as I well know, uh, you enjoy the ritual of knowing where you're going, uh, the camaraderie of your physician. And uh, for many of them, since uh, it, they really can't get out on their own, we have intergenerational programs of youngsters that uh, help take them to the, uh, to the uh, clinic uh, or over to the hospital itself. And uh, now with the MTA cuts, those youngsters uh, won't be able to have, the, uh, have the, uh, the card to get and help the seniors. So I thought that maybe Commissioner Dean should have recused himself, first off, because he was involved with Continuum. And as we all know, he's worried about yields, just like he was running airlines instead of hospitals, that uh, the bottom line was it will look very good when uh, Governor Patterson leaves and he doesn't have a job, that he can go back to Continuum. And without St. Vincent's, he'll be filling his beds in Roosevelt and filling his beds in Beth Israel. So he should have recused himself. And secondly... I heard reports. I heard reports that, in fact, the Mount Sinai deal was so close, but because Commissioner Danes allowed the New York Medical College to decertify the residence program, he allowed that to go. And when uh, Mount Sinai heard that they wouldn't have the residents there at uh, St. Vincent's, they said, we can't run a hospital without residents, and that's why they backed out. Now, this is the way Danes works and Al Smith's board. It shouldn't even be state. It should be federal, and I think they should be brought up on the RICO charges, especially if this woman who worked there, if this woman who worked there can't even file work for the cop, that's corruption. My ancestors saw St. Vincent's being built. The little red and white house that I got my first shots when I was a little kid. And my mother was the first in her family to be born in a hospital in 1920 in that hospital, St. Vincent's. My mother and father passed away in that hospital and most of my family. They must be running through the hallway saying, what is going on? It's a terrible thing that happened. They have saved my life many times mentally and physically. They treated me like family. If I needed my hair cut, if I needed to be washed, whatever it was, there was somebody there. It was my second home. It's terrible to say that a hospital is your second home, but it, it was. It was my second home. They treated me like a human being. I don't see, and they took care of me. Anytime I was in there, they made sure that over my bed it said, climb. And they washed over my family with kid gloves. When my pop passed away five years ago, 
I had to get him out of the VA hospital before they destroyed him. And I called the social worker from St. Vincent's and they got him over there. And then I saw my dad in clean pajamas and his hair cut and he looked wonderful. And I can only say I'm going to miss the staff because they were wonderful. They're like my family. I could tell you the stories of how St. Vincent's has saved my life twice, once without any time to spare. Um, and I had no idea how much I would ever need that hospital. But a friend of mine said to me yesterday that my cats could actually get quicker emergency care and to a hospital quicker than I can now, which is unbelievable, but it's true. And I survived St. Vincent's in 1972. My mom had a stroke in New Jersey, and two doctors, Dr. Robert J. Walsh and Peter Cyrus Rizzo, brought her over from Raritan Valley Hospital, and before you know it, she was walking and talking. Another incident was that my son had a car accident, and he was brought to St. Vincent's. They saved his life. I had five children there. I really am very sad today that they are leaving. I've had to use St. Vincent's, and I know how important it must be. In our hearts, where is the providing of the common good when everything is hidden, that we can't find the books? And why don't we look to our federal government and our president to see this as that we're not just a city. We're New York City. And this is affects it's just another manifestation. It's going to happen every place else also. It's another way of playing a game with money. Because money isn't lost. It's redistributed. I think there's some kind of thing that we can do, at least Yetta can, and she's tried before, is to get out to the bars and clubs and make them aware that their patrons are under severe penalty for not having this hospital here. There are so many bars and restaurants that go right down to Wall Street that they don't have that facility. And I can't tell you, because I've seen it, I've been here a long time, and I've been a party person, that if without that hospital, so I think we should go to the, to the businesses, have them put a placard on there that they support it, and have them do something in a very, won't be the word, effective, effective way. Yet yeah, myself and some of the others, we've been out going store to store, encouraging owners to put the signs up about the meeting here tonight. And I think we're going to include that, that idea as we continue to go forward and go store to store to mom and pop shops. As we heard from a lady here, that it's like a mini Katrina in the medical world that is happening here. But what's also very interesting is that I just found out today that you know the Federal Reserve is not owned by the government. It's owned by a private corporation. I never knew that. I never knew about the books, the double standards of books, like we didn't know about the MTA when they were supposed to give us better services. Or when Washington Square was, we had people picketing against that atrocity that which once was beautiful. I want to say something about our community, which I have been terribly disappointed with. Not all of us here. There's an old village and there's a new village. Okay? And the new village went out and protested when they were going to take down some historical buildings, okay? They were, they were closing the streets. They didn't come out to close the streets when health care and, and the welfare was at stake. Um, this is, so we had red flags. Scott Rudin gave us red flags. Listening to or remembering Mayor Mike going on endlessly about that Vacocta Stadium he wanted yeah. here on the West Side. <laughs> what happened? Nothing. He fought so vigorously for that. And all we've gotten now is a deadly silence from him. A deadly silence that is going to have people dying. Like, I was just in the hospital recovering from surgery at St. The Hospital. Only one. St. Vincent's. The Hospital. And my wife came to visit me. And I was up on the 12th floor and I was looking south in the view. I could see some of the river. And my wife said, wow, that's a million dollar view. And you know what? Mayor Mike and his real estate moguls, I'm sure they are salivating over that million dollar view. And we can't, I don't know how we can ever get, a, a, get him into this equation 
I wish we we should actually uh, do what they they did with um, the, the, yeah we should, we should have him I don't know I forget what the word is get him revoked get like a recall. Recall. recall we should have a recall for Mayor Mike I think it might be important that there's also Cuomo's information because he wants to get elected and we vote. Who the hell is on the board of St. Vincent's? Yeah. We have the names now, but when we were starting to look into the, the background to build a case, we went, went to their website, you can't find it. Since they didn't file with the Attorney General, we couldn't find it. It took a lot of work. We actually found it in the bankruptcy <coughs> court files, but they really, they, 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 took, they immediately took their names off their website, and other hospitals obviously boast about the quality of their board of directors. Those names so. should be public, yeah. and they yes. should be yes. able to yeah, we're in the process of setting up a website, I just want to say real quick, and maybe that's one of the things that we'll post. Not, not their home address, because that would scare me, but, but their names and, and who they are, so that you can know that information. I, I can sense a critical mass developing with this. Uh, and the other thing, I think want to ask, um, I guess Senator Dwayne has left, but some even Godfrey, given the committee's legislators chair can they have hearings also recalling how Goldman Sachs CEOs top management were wiggling and squirming before a Senate committee what can be done if the city as well as a state level city council level and federal level it may well be that there are other levels of government uh, like uh, Congress and the US Senate uh, that have a lot more ability uh, to do the kind of job investigatively uh, that's really needed here. Until there's focus, and it doesn't have to happen tonight, there won't be any action. Right? right? So when we sit on our hands, we lose. The people in this room aren't sitting on their hands. They're taking action. When we express our action, our anger, we can begin to act. But until we articulate our specific wins, demands, and needs, our elected officials don't have a way to act on our behalf. We want a hospital. We want a hospital. So what's the action we want to create? Awareness. An RFP, a request for proposal, produced a winner, Lennox Hill, to create urgent care and not a hospital. Not good enough. Do we want a new RFP that calls for a hospital and that produces a winner that creates a hospital? Yes. I'm an outpatient at St. Vincent's. I was an outpatient this morning. had to walk through police lines to get into my appointment. And I want to tell you that every single elected official stood in front of St. Vincent's, stood in front of St. Vincent's the morning after the board closed it and did not call for a hospital. They called for an urgent care center. There had been some discussion amongst them because every single one of them said the same thing. The only one that was absent was Deborah Glick. And she sent a message saying that she was up in Albany trying to do something about it. Senator Duane was very angry, but he also called for, at that time, an urgent care. Things change. You notice some of the political rhetoric tonight. I'm shocked that Chris isn't here. I don't care what her agenda was. She should have been here. She's the speaker. She's the closest one to the mayor. And, you know, just take that home. This is her district. This is her district. I went to almost every single community meeting on St. Vincent's in that awful plan they had to tear down the hospitals and put up condominiums with no affordable housing. That community group that they formed by the end of all those hours and hours and hours of discussion got up and said, we achieved nothing because St. Vincent's did exactly what they wanted to do. Eileen. I got her back. I got hit on my bicycle between 16th and 17th Street a year ago. And I walked, made a mistake, I walked over to St. Vincent's because if you come in an ambulance, they see you much quicker. I walked over, you know, and I had a broken arm, and after 15 hours in that emergency room, I got up and said, I need some ice. 
and three security people were going to throw me out. And I had the wherewithal to say, I want to see the head nurse. Now, I don't know if you're the head nurse, Eileen, and I don't know if that's who I saw, but you sure look like this person who came out and saw this angry person in pain, and she said to me, Mr. Forath, what can I do for you? That's what the nurses said, and she got me the ice. My friend Susan Sarandon was at a hearing that I was at, and, the, and people keep misquoting her. She talked about the conditions in the emergency room, which were so overutilized that you had to wait many, many, many hours to be seen. And it wasn't the nurse's fault. You know? No one has mentioned the insurance companies. Do you want to know about where this debt comes from? Do you want to know where all the, a lot of it's the insurance companies and the real estate people that speculate around St. Vincent? I want to put one other thing in the, in the, in the center, Yenna. All those businesses, those mom and pop stores, and they're mostly mom and pop stores, around St. Vincent's with those, I was about to use an Anglo-Saxon word, with those high rents, you know, those are all going to be out of business now because those thousands of employees are not there. Where is the mayor? Where is Christine Quinn? And don't let these politicians get away with their nice talk. They're not standing in front of St. Vincent's today. They're not saying this will not happen. They have to, we have to put some fire under their feet, and we can. I have a very personal uh, involvement with St. Vincent's as well. Uh, my daughter was uh, attending lab school on West uh, 17th Street, walking down uh, Broadway and uh, 12th Street when uh, a, a, a huge a wooden, um, the, the wooden thing that they put, uh, they stored the pallets, fell from a truck and, 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 and it, um, fell on her shoulder and paralyzed her. Uh, and she was rushed to St. Vincent's, uh, which is the only pediatric intensive care unit uh, in all of the West Side. Now, her, uh, uh, her ped pediatrician, Bonnie Franklin, is affiliated with uh, St. Vincent's. Uh, our hospital, this downtown hospital, does not have a pediatric uh, care uh, uh, center. And uh, she was rushed to St. Vincent's. Uh, we did not know for three nights while well, she stayed at the pediatric ICU uh, whether that paralysis was permanent or not. It was a very scary time for us. But she got to St. Vincent's in minutes. Minutes. And that is gone forever for the students at lab school, for the community in the village, for all of us here in this room, and for everybody living downtown in the million dollar condominiums that have cropped up in uh, Tribeca. And I will tell everybody buying all those condominiums along the, uh, the water uh, that uh, you now have lost all of that uh, as well. Uh, I'm telling you also in terms of where is the mayor, I have been sitting here handing out every one of these brochures that I had and people are telling me how do I reach out? I will tell you tonight, when you go home, and I'm going to do it and I suggest all of you tell your friends, go home, call 311, say there is an emergency, we no longer have a hospital in the country. She came here from Puerto Rico in 1956, pregnant, had no money. They took her in at St. Vincent's. Child was given birth to, healthy. She got to go to a clinic for 25 cents. Oh. And 50 cents for me. That's all. They help me a lot. A lot. I don't have no problem with that. And they say, see if, see if I ever make any contribution. Contrib con I'm not a village resident. Um, I'm a New Yorker. I've lived overseas for six years. 
I came home to fight for my hospital. I came home in August of 2009 at 32 weeks pregnant to have my son at St. Vincent. He was born on September 11th, and I am so proud that he was born at that hospital on that day. We cannot let St. Vincent go. There's too many mothers who need that hospital. For the first 16 years of my life, I've been a resident of the West Village, and right now I live in East 21st Street. I'm a lot more relieved about that, because at least if I have an emergency in my neighborhood, I have a hospital to go to. And that's, and that's right. I, I have a lot of hospitals to go to. Uh, I'm 19 now, but, but for the first 16 years of my life, I lived at 245 Waverly Place, which is, you know, uh, maybe two blocks away from St. Vincent's. And I would like to request each, uh, think of each and every one of you, write to your elected officials and say, hey, why don't you stop funding on some of these unnecessary projects, like renovating Penn Station, like the 2nd Avenue subway. My daughter's 42 years old now, but when she was five, I brought her to St. Vincent's and they saved her life. She was choked. And the other thing, and I hope it's okay to tell something that I wasn't witness to, but an elderly friend of mine was in Washington Square Park three weeks ago with his health aide, and um, a woman was turning blue and becoming motionless, and the park ranger called 911. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. At 4.20, the ambulance came from Beekman downtown, and she was dead. My son had emotional issues. He's great now. We lived in Brooklyn. We slept to St. Vincent every week because there was a group for teenagers that had caring therapists who were there for him when he needed it. And years ago, and like we said, most of us are old enough to remember this, my sister got beaten in an anti-war rally. Upper East Side, guess who would take those people? <laughs> the they would pay St. Vincent. In terms of seniors, the other day, I had to call an ambulance for a 90-year-old woman. It took half an hour for the ambulance to get here from Roosevelt Hospital. Thank God, by the time she got, they got here, she was fine. People are going to die from this community, and who's going to care? Maybe they'll start to care if somebody's rich kid is out clubbing and gets shot or killed or is high or something. I don't know. Yeah, or a tourist. So, for seniors, people 85 and older are the fastest growing demographic in New York City. There has been underutilization, there has been mismanagement, let's admit it. But this community needs a hospital, and more and more buildings are being built here. Whatever else you think of these people, they'll have medical needs too. And the entire community, rich and poor, working class, all of us need a hospital. We are collecting people's stories here at the Hudson Guild Fulton Center. We don't need a $700 million expansion like they were talking about in the tools building. You know those 18, 14 million dollars in heal monies? We could take those monies and use adaptive reuse to upgrade the facilities as they are now. We're gonna go home, we're gonna talk to our neighbors. We're gonna talk about the difference between urgent care and emergency care. We're gonna talk about adaptive reuse for the St. Vincent's Hospital as it is now. And we're going to make sure we sign up on that mailing list and we will take all of the things that you've talked about tonight. We're going to plan another forum. We're thinking and hoping that it's going to be in the West Village just to let everyone know that it is many neighborhoods and many communities uh, that are affected by this. And I hope that all of you will join us. We'll write a letter to Governor Patterson and to Mayor Bloomberg and to Commissioner Daines to make sure that they understand that we are coming together as a community and we will not stop until we have a hospital for the Lower West Side of Manhattan. The nurses who went to college recently rece received checks from St. Vincent's for reimbursement, which is part of our contract. Those checks bounced. Okay. Number two, we're all unemployed now, and we're all trying to get unemployment insurance. We went online and registered, and found out that we haven't worked at St. Vincent's in the year 2009, because St. Vincent's, probably for the last three years, has not 
uh, registered with the State Department of Labor, which they're supposed to do quarterly. So I think the only people in here are the politicians that have any kind of, of leverage to stop the insanity and have a federal investigation of what is going on. politicians know that it's just not good enough. And do not allow them to tell you urgent care is good enough. Do not allow the media, do not allow the politicians to give you anything short of a hospital. they want you out in the streets, I want you to take five people with you, and I want you out there in the streets. It has been an honor and a privilege to take care of this community. And when I leave, I leave with a broken heart, okay? I want you to fix that heart for me. I want to read in the newspaper that there's a hospital in Lower Manhattan. 